Well, we welcome you today to our Palm Sunday service, you who are here in the sanctuary, and of course you folks who are at home, our church family members, as well as friends of our church, we welcome you also to the service today, again as we worship the Lord together. Let us begin with our call to worship that we'll read responsively. The call to worship printed in the bulletin. Save us now, O Lord. Save us now, we pray. God's light shines upon us and keeps us one in Christ. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let's look to God in prayer, shall we, for the invocation, then we'll sing the Gloria Patre at the conclusion of the invocation. Almighty and all-knowing God, in your wisdom you brought us into your kingdom. You brought us into your kingdom through the sufferings of Jesus on the cross, lest any of us should boast. Lord, help us seek daily to be more worthy of your love. For we ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power 
and the glory forever. Amen. before Mary Ellen comes to give the official welcome. Uh, this is Palm Sunday. Do all of our children, and if you're a child up to 100, you can do this as well. Uh, if all of the children here have palms, we have palms to wave. So would you wave your palms at us? Would you raise them up and wave them? There, there you go. See, see Evie, watch her. It's good. She's waving that around. That's good. We wave it like the people did. Oh, and then they're bringing palms to the people now. If you didn't get a palm, raise your hand. Oh, look at this. Good. This is good. Keep waving till all everybody has a palm. <laughs> May get tired out. Isn't that nice? Look at Avia here in the front waving her palm. That's good. Okay, good. God bless you and welcome to our Palm Sunday service today. God bless you. Now, Mary Ellen, it's your turn. No, no, I have a phone. Well, there will be lots of... Am I on? I'm waving. Um, am I not on? Am I on? Oh, there'll be lots of palm waving downstairs in the fellowship hall later. So all kids, get ready. Get, get yourself warmed up. Um, I would like to welcome everyone to the worship service this morning, whether you're here in the sanctuary or at home. Uh, I hope you will be blessed by something that will carry you through the Holy Week. To all of the parents here in the sanctuary today, you should bring home a wreath kit to be completed at your leisure this week, if there is any leisure during spring break for parents, um, and display it for all to see. And if you're joining in virtually, you will be re receiving your wreath and empty eggs for the egg hunt um, uh, via carrier pigeon later on in this week. Um, just to let you know that all of the children, so you, if you want to be ready, after the announcement, we're going to sing our song, What a Mighty God We Serve. But before that, we have Jamie and Bradley who are going to share something with us. Come on up, Jamie and Bradley. Okay. Good morning, church. This past month, the children of SCBC participated in March Mission Madness. We learned about what it means to serve. When we serve others, we are serving God. We learned from Miss Asia and Miss Erin about their people, about their mission trips, and all the fun they had serving the different people. Next, we learned from Mr. Jared about how he serves the community at the soup kitchen, and we helped by making 50 bag lunches. Finally, we learned from Ms. Doris about our mission work here at SEBC and what we can do for our church. We learned that no act of kindness is too small, and we are never too small to serve. We sent cards and care packages to our church family who haven't been able to be with us. To serve our people, our earth, and all of God's creations, we also made a box 
where we can put our church programs into at the end of service so we can recycle them. This box will be located in North X. By the door, please put your papers into it on your way out. Or please ask anyone of us to collect it for you. Thank you. To God be the glory. I got it. Thanks. Great job. Wow. Oh, was that in the script? I don't, I don't know. That, yeah? So continue, to continue with our, come on up, Mr. Swain. To continue with our um, announcements this morning, um, Swain and I have been asked to talk about um, the relief bus. Now, it could take all morning to talk about the relief bus because there is just so much going on in that wonderful mission, but I'm just going to, I'm going to encapsulate and I'm sure Swain will tell you more about it. Um, one of my favorite things about the relief bus is that um, it, on the front page of, on their home page, it says in the window of the actual relief bus, there's a sign. It says, can we help you? A job, shelter, drug and alcohol program, detox, food, clothing, and prayer. There is no end of, to the services that the relief bus provides for all of the, um, the clients who come and show up to them, um, to, to their, that they serve at their bus. Um, the impression that is made on me is the desire to make personal, co co personal connections by being at the same locations and times seven days a week. Most people come to the Lord not by having someone bang, the, bang them on their head and drag them to church, but by creating a relationship with them and seeing what their immediate needs are met. And only then, after that relationship is deepened, can you share the story of salvation and everything is done to maintain the client's dignity with the relief bus. Um, there is follow-up and connecting cl the clients to appropriate professional services. And um, I just hope you all give generously. And Swain will speak much more eloquently now. Yeah. Uh, I, don't, I don't think so, but you're, you're Miss Eloquent. Um, <laughs> But here, we're just here to continue the theme. Uh, we've, have you noticed, uh, Daryl had mentioned a couple of weeks ago that we kind of simplified the giving process. And uh, last week, Will spoke about uh, the America for Christ uh, component last week. And this week, we're doing the same. We're just highlighting the relief bus. And uh, the Easter mission offering basically is going to support the outfacing missionary support that we do. And I can speak personally to the relief bus. And there are several of us who actually has been out with the, with the relief bus to, to serve and from a personal standpoint, I like their approach. It's, it's a three-prong approach where they're in direct contact with the, uh, the, the client through per, and uh, you know, they're sharing the gospel with them. And then the other part is that they're feeding, supplying physical needs, which Jesus speaks about. And the last prong is that they help these men and women transition into, back into society. And to me, that's, that's the full package. You're meeting a need, you're praying, you're sharing the gospel, but you're also not just saying, good be blessed and, you know, take care. They're actually making connections and they're counseling these individuals, which I've seen firsthand. Daryl has been there. Ben, uh, I think, have done, done with us too. And I think Pastor Mark is uh, actually doing things when he was here. But um, the thing is, we as a church need to be more involved and more active. And this is the perfect way for us to do it. It's in our backyard, so to speak. And it's an opportunity for us to actually engage as a, 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 in, in writing checks and also engage in actually being hands and feet on, 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 the, on the mission field. And as I said, I've personally been involved here and I think it works. And I, I remember one of the days I was there and I met this, this, this young man who uh, was homeless and he was telling me his story that, you know, they, 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 they met his three felt needs, but most importantly, he was a runner and they actually helped counsel connect him with the resources and he ended up running the New York uh, City Marathon, which I thought was, you had a guy got saved, 
He loves to run. He engaged, rehabilitated, 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 and he's on mission. He's running, charity support, doing things, and I think that's, to me, that's a good thing for us to get involved in. So hopefully, as Mary Ellen said, you will uh, support the mission. You'll cut the, uh, write a check, and the key here is that always put the mission in the memo field if you're using a check on the envelope, the mission uh, field and envelope, or if you're using Zelle, put it in the memo field that this is for mission, and it will be get allocated to uh, the, uh, the relief bus, and, um, and uh, thank you for your support. Amen. Video she's going to show, which I think is going to explain some more. Also. This year, New York City Relief marks 30 years of making space at the table. We exist to compassionately serve the struggling and homeless by offering hope and resources that lead towards life transformation. We started in 1989 when the Bible verses from Isaiah 58 about sharing your food with the hungry and giving shelter to the homeless came alive to Richard and Dixie Galloway. They felt led to move to New York City and serve people struggling with poverty and homelessness. Today in 2019, we have seven outreach vehicles. We go to eight outreaches a week in five different locations. And now we actually have two outreach models. The Relief Bus is our mobile resource center, which provides food, hygiene kits, and a safe, welcoming space where connections can be made. The Relief Co-op is a partnership with other organizations where a homeless population is already congregated. We help create an encouraging atmosphere and hold life care visits. In the past 30 years, we've actually served over 7 million servings of food and beverage. We've mobilized over 96,000 volunteers, and we've made 456,000 one-on-one -on -one connections with people experiencing homelessness. In the past 10 years alone, we've connected people from the street with 11,700 resources. As of December 2018, New York City has the largest homeless population of any city in the United States, with almost 79,000 people reported homeless. Every outreach is critical. Rain, sleet, snow, or heat, our guests can count on us to be there for them. Driving someone directly to rehab, advocating for them as they navigate the social services we've connected them to, praying together for strength. The connections we make can literally be the difference between life and death. Our six year strategy is actually to add two outreaches each year and completely saturate the New York City metro area by having an outreach location within walking distance of each major transportation hub in New York and New Jersey. Making space at the table is ultimately about creating space in our lives to give of our time, energy, and resources to help others realize the potential that God intended for their lives. What kind of space will you make? What kind of space will you make? Come join us at the table. Oh, yeah. Can I have all the children up front?
Mm-hmm. Come on, Lily. Abby. Doris, is my guitar <clears throat> We're shouting? Doris, is the guitar on? It's on. So it's mighty, what a mighty God we serve, what a mighty God we trust, what a mighty God we know, serve, no, 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 love, serve. Hello, Elena, come on up. Do you want to come stand here? So, thank you, Eliana. Yeah, you want to come stand here. Nice. So, so we're on theme with um, what a mighty God we serve. breathe. Good morning, church. <laughs> Our Old Testament lesson is taken from the 118th chapter of Psalms, verses 1 to 2, and then verse 19 through 29. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say, his love endures forever. Open for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession. Up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. 
And as we said at the beginning of the reading, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. This is the word of the Lord. At this time in our service, we look to God in prayer, but I have two other announcements uh, that we want to make. This week's a very special week in our church life. We not only have our Sunday services, but on Thursday night, of course, on Wednesday, we have a prayer circle that is also on through Zoom and also in attendance in the Fellowship Hall at 7 o'clock. And on Thursday, we have our Monday Thursday service. We hope you will consider being here for that. That's Thursday night at 7 p.m. It'll be a communion service and also a service where we're going to emphasize Monday. Monday means commandment. And Jesus gave the last commandment, which is to love one another. And so that service is a gathering of thinking of the love of God and thinking of love for one another, as well as a communion service. And again, on Friday at 7 p.m., we have our Good Friday service, and that'll be a tenebrae service with readers and music and, of course, extinguishing the candles, getting near to the time when we think of Jesus going to the cross. So that's Thursday night at 7, Monday, Thursday, and then on Friday at 7 o'clock, the Good Friday service. Let's look to God in prayer, shall we? Our Heavenly Father, we come now into your holy presence. We come, O oh God, to praise you. We come to shout, Hosanna, save us, O oh God. And we're thankful, Lord, that when we call upon you to give us salvation, that you so readily gives, give that to us, and we praise you and thank you for that. And we thank you as we think of that, we think of you sending your son into this world to go to a cross to die for our sins. And we praise you for that. And we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for the love of your son being willing to come into this world to die on the cross. And oh, our God, as we think of this week, this very sacred week in our church calendar, when we think of the gathering of the disciples for the Last Supper and Jesus' commandment to them that they would love one another and that people would know they are his, your disciples if they love one another. We think of that in our own lives and ask that that would be true for us as well. Our God, we think of Good Friday. We think, Lord God, of what it cost you in sending your Son. We think also the heartbreak you must have gone through, our Heavenly Father, as you saw, saw your son dying there on that cross in all that ignominy and shame. And so we come today, O oh God, thinking of all that you've done for us, asking that we today would even rededicate our lives to service to you and to one another. We think of our church, our Father. We thank you for gathering, for allowing us to gather today here in the service, in the sanctuary, and those that are at home with us. And we pray your blessing upon us, Lord. And we pray that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher in this service. We think also, our Father, of those in our church family who are going through difficult times, some who are ill, some who have family members who are ill, some that are going through times of depression, others going through times, difficult times because of this virus that we've it's been experiencing this past year. We pray, Lord, that you would meet the need in each one's life. And we pray that not only for ourselves, but we pray for those round about us throughout our country and throughout the world. We think of families that have lost loved ones because of the COVID virus. We pray for comfort for them. We pray for those that, have been, that are ill, have been ill, Lord. We pray for healing for them and just your blessing in their lives. We ask today, our Father, for the ministries that we have in our church. We're thankful for local ministries as we heard this morning. 
We're thankful for the outreach ministries of the American Baptist churches. We thank the Lord of the home missions and the sacrifice so many do throughout the country in serving you in the church work and in mission work and in college campus work and all different kinds of ministries. We thank you for that. And then, Lord, we pray that as we continue now in this worship service today, that everything will be to the praise of your glory. For we pray this in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Amen.
welcome to our service. Now as we worship God together, let's look to God in prayer before we read the scripture. Our Father, we pray now that as we meditate on your word and even read your word, our Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher. And we'll thank you for we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our gospel lesson today is taken from the gospel of Mark the 11th chapter, beginning with verse 1 on through verse 11. Mark chapter 11, beginning with verse 1 on through verse 11. When they, that is Jesus and his disciples, were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent his two disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a coat that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say this, The Lord has need of it, and, it will, I will, and that we will send it back immediately. And they went away and found the colt, tied near a door outside in the street. And as they were untying, untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches or palm branches, as it says in John's Gospel, that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, which means save, O save. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And then Jesus entered Jerusalem and went to the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went to Bethany with the twelve. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's always a joy to, to read and to think about the Lord's entry into Jerusalem. On this we call the triumphal entry of our Lord Jesus. It's recorded in all four Gospels. And today I want to talk with you about that. But before I do that, I can't help but on Palm Sunday the children are gone, so I should have told this before. I can't help but tell this story that I've been telling for years. A little boy was very active in the church and would love to get to church on Palm Sunday and wave the palms. But one particular Palm Sunday, he was sick at home in bed and, of course, couldn't go. His father came home from church that day with palms in his hand. And the little boy said, Daddy, why do we wave palms in church on Palm Sunday? The father said, well, son, you know, when Jesus would go into a town, went into a town, the people waved palm branches to honor him. And so he said, on Palm Sunday, we we wave palm branches to honor Jesus. The little boy stopped, thought for a minute, and he said, oh, no. He said, the one Sunday I miss church and Jesus shows up. (laughs) Well, that's a child's idea of it. But you know, it's true, isn't it? In the spirit, Jesus is with us. For the word of God says, where two or three are gathered together in the name of the Lord, so the Lord is with us together. But what a day that must have been. Jesus is riding into Jerusalem. People were coming, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people were gathered in Jerusalem for the Passover. People from all the known world were coming there to celebrate the Passover together. But in the midst of this group of people, there was also a crowd of people that knew all about Jesus. 
Word had traveled far and wide about him, his healing, his teaching, because he taught with authority, his preaching, and people used to love to come to hear him preach, and then his healing of so many people, and then his love for people that he really cared. Didn't matter who they were, Jesus reached out to care for them, to help them. And so people gathered, and when they saw him coming, Though some were taken back because he was riding in on a donkey. Though in the Old Testament book of Zechariah, it's prophesied that the Messiah would ride in on a donkey, representing coming in with peace. And so as he rode in, some were expecting, of course, Jesus to ride in on a great horse. Th still thinking in their minds that he was going to bring victory to them over the Romans who were terrorizing the people. But Jesus came in riding in on the donkey and the people gathered. And of course, as they saw him coming, some looked their cloaks on the road for, the, for him to ride over in honor of him. Others took out palm branches and waved them and put them down in the road for him to ride over as a symbol of honor of Jesus. And so the people were gathered there that day. And what a day it must have been. Shouting Hosanna, which literally means save. That's the message that people have cried out to Jesus ever since. Save us, O Lord. And thank God when we cry that out to God, God does give us salvation. God does save us. Hosanna to the son of David, they cried out, shouting out there on that road that day. But it's interesting. Of the four gospel accounts, Mark has the shortest. Again, we believe he got most of his information from Peter, who traveled so closely with Jesus. And this is a rather condensed version showing what Jesus was doing. And notice what it goes on then to say, as, as we see here. Uh, it says here that after, after the parade, Jesus, it says, entered Jerusalem, and he went into the temple courts, and he looked around at everything. But since it was already late, he went to Bethany. Mark goes immediately from the parade of people shouting Hosanna to talking about Jesus going into Jerusalem and into the court of the temple. And he looks around. And then, of course, it's the end of the day and he's tired. And he goes to Bethany, undoubtedly to the house of uh, Mary and Martha and Lazarus. He had just raised Lazarus from the dead. And he goes there to their home to rest with his 12 disciples with him. His disciples with him, rather, the 11. And we find here that Jesus is in the courtyard of the temple. There's been much speculation. What must have gone through Jesus' mind as he was in the courtyard of the temple? He was in Jerusalem. Remember, as recorded in Mark, the 10th chapter, he tells his disciples that he is going to go to Jerusalem. And he's going to go there to Jerusalem. And he's going to be taken and arrested. He's going to be tried. He's going to be abused. He's going to be crucified. And then the third day he would rise again. The disciples didn't follow it. They didn't understand. In fact, they still thought that he would become king and, and reign over them, you know, or reign over all the people and destroy the Romans from, de from all the persecution they were giving to the people. In fact, one of them, two of them, it's interesting, James and John, who you'd think would have known Jesus the best almost of anybody. They said, Lord, when you come into your kingdom, would you put one of us on your left-hand side and one on the right? They didn't understand. So Jesus, when he goes into the temple, he looks around at the courtyard. Somebody said, probably he thought of the money changers, but I don't think so. The next day, remember, he chased the money changers out of the temple because they were abusing people and taking advantage of people and disrespecting the house of God. But he may have looked around, he may have looked at the columns of the temple. And as the God-man knowing that within a short time later that temple would be destroyed, and 40 years later it was. 
He may have looked around. He may have seen the curtain between the Holy of Holies where only the priest went in once a year and the other parts of the temple. And he may have realized and it came, might have come to his mind that when he would die on the cross, that, that curtain that was between the Holy of Holies and the rest of the, the temple, that curtain would be torn in two, be rent in twain, as it says to us in the scripture. But I think most of all, Imagine, he must have been thinking about the cross. He was in Jerusalem now. There was no more talking about going to the cross. He was there. He knew what was going to happen. He knew he was going to be arrested. He knew he was going to be taken. And he would be there and he would be beaten. He would be betrayed by one of his own disciples. He knew all that. He knew he would stand trial at a mock trial, and then he knew that he would be taken out and handed over to the Gentile Romans to be again beaten and humiliated and have to carry a cross to go up Golgotha's hill toward Calvary. He knew that he would be there on the cross and he would suffer physically. We can't imagine what that must have been like horrible suffering physically that he went through. But I think not only of that, but I think of the suffering he experienced psychologically, emotionally going through that. But even more than anything else, the suffering he went through spiritually, when he who took your sins and my sins upon himself and all the sins of all mankind, and he took all that on himself and it separated him for that time between him and the Father, and he's separated and he cries out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Think of the suffering. And as he's standing in that courtyard, I believe all that must have gone through his mind, what he was about to face. But maybe the average person would have tried to run away to escape. But not so, for the Bible tells us that he had set his face toward Jerusalem. He had gone there. That's why he came to earth. That's why he became the God-man, so that he would go to the cross to die for the forgiveness of our sins. And as we come to this week, it's important that we keep reminding ourselves of what Jesus did on that cross and what he went through. And so I've been thinking about that. And I've been thinking about Jesus and what to talk with you about this morning. And three words come to mind. I think of Jesus' courage. I think of Jesus' commitment. And I think of Jesus' compassion. And I want to talk with you about that today. And then how it can apply to us in our own lives. I think of Jesus' courage. Imagine facing a cross that he was to go through there on that cross, all that suffering that I just mentioned to you. Think of the courage he must have had to be able to do that. It, 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 it's, it's almost unbelievable that anybody could have that courage. He could have called 10,000 angels to have stopped it, to have done anything to keep himself from doing it. But because of his great courage, he didn't do that. He faced the cross. He knew what was he was to experience. But not only that, but I think also of his commitment. Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, when the Bible says he literally sweat drops of blood, he cries out to the Father, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. And there in that garden of Gethsemane, he reaffirmed his commitment to do what the Father wanted, his mission here on earth. He was committed to doing what the Father wanted. But above all that, I think of his compassion, his love. Jesus' whole ministry is just filled with one story after the other of compassion. Compassion, remember the 5,000, they were hungry and he had compassion on them and he 
performed the miracle of the 5,000, feeding the 5,000. I think of the woman taken in adultery, how he stopped them from stoning her because he had compassion on her. I think of the blind and the deaf, and I think of all the people, the people that were demon-possessed, how he had compassion on them and delivered them. Over and over, the Bible talks about his compassion, his love. But then his love for you and me, that he would go to the cross to die for our sins. As I think of this Palm Sunday and Jesus, the record of him given by Mark, to go into the temple courtyard, I'm sure he must have thought of that, all that he would face, but he had courage. He was committed, and above all that, he had compassion. What does that say to you and to me? in our lives. If Jesus had that courage, what about us? Do we need to ask God to give us more courage? To give us more courage to share our faith with others? To give us more courage to stand for what is right, for justice? When we see things round about us, how many people do we know that they see things happening and they never will open their mouths because they are afraid of the flack that they will experience if they open their mouths and stand for truth and stand for what is right? How many people never share their faith? They'll be with a group of people and people will be talking. Now, I don't mean that you bombard people with, you know, just trying to ram it down their throats being insensitive to people. I don't mean that at all. There was a time in my own life when I used to go out and pick up hitchhikers so I have an opportunity to witness to them when I was a young Christian. But I found that the most important way we can be there in helping people and drawing them to the Savior is to ask the Holy Spirit of God to guide us, to direct us to people, and then to give us an opportunity at the right time to open up and share what God has done for us, not trying to put up a wall that so often some forms of witnessing will do. But we need to have courage, courage to stand for the right thing. And how many people are so afraid of doing that? It's interesting, I find that people that are anti things that are spiritual very often have no problem whatsoever in sharing what they believe. But unfortunately, very often people who know the Lord will be afraid of sharing what they believe. We need to have the courage that Jesus had to go to the cross. I remember years ago, when I was a senior in high school, I. I worked as a copy boy on the city newspaper. There were four of us that were copy boys, and three others were all college students, and I was a senior in high school. And one night over the teletype, and a copy boy would, in those days, would take out the UPS uh, information and take it out, you know, for the linotype operators to print it for the newspaper or to take it to the desk of the writers. But over the wire came one night. There's five missionaries in Quito, Ecuador had been killed. This was back in 19, this is before, I'm looking out, a few of you at least were not even born then, back in 1956. And I remember how horrified I was as I read that. I remember what one of the other copy boys said to me when he saw it, he said, you know, if they'd stayed home and minded their own business, that wouldn't have happened to them. But I thought of those five missionaries. Nat Saint was one well-known, others. They went down there to Ecuador as missionaries, and they heard of this remote tribe who was a very vicious tribe, but they knew that they needed the gospel. And these five men went into this territory of the Aka Indians to share their faith with them. And of course, they speared them to death and the five missionaries died. But you know, it's interesting. Some years later, 
some of the wives of those missionaries that had been slain, they went in. And they even had the privilege of leading some of those men that had killed the missionary, leading them to Christ as Savior. It's often been said that no mission field has ever been opened without the shedding of blood. That it begins with people who have given their lives to give out the message of the gospel. That's courage. And I say to you, the only way we can have that courage is to ask God for it. Because in ourselves, at least in myself, I wouldn't have that kind of courage. But using Jesus as our example, we need more courage to stand for what we know and to share our faith. Then also, he had commitment. Jesus was committed, not my will, but thy will be done. We need commitment in our lives. We need to be committed to the Lord. We live in a time when it seems like there is so little commitment that people are willing to make to follow after spiritual things. I read a couple of quotes that I want to read to you today, or I jotted or I clipped them out to read it to you. One preacher said this. He said he was speaking to a group of students on one of the prominent universities in the country. And they, these students that he was talking to had expressed an interest in going into ministry. When asked how many of them would definitely commit to going into ministry, only one of those people raised their hand that they would definitely commit to going into ministry because they felt God led them. One young lady then spoke up to this minister and said this, I have a problem with your use of the word commitment. That sounds very binding and very restricting. Imagine talking about re committing to serving God. Another one wrote this about it. It said, this preacher said, our concept of consumerism has crept into the church. To recruit people and to be marketable, we think we need to be able to say, look what our church can offer you instead of what the Lord wants you to do in your life related to him. A third one said this, I would suggest to you that the rich young ruler, remember the rich young ruler went to Jesus? And he wanted to follow Jesus, and Jesus said, you've got to sell what you have to follow me. In other words, if you're going to follow me, you've got to be committed to me, and following me has got to be first in your life. And, of course, the rich young ruler wouldn't do that. But anyway, this preacher said this. When the rich young ruler walked away sorrowful that day, he was not the only one. I think it's safe to assume, he said, that a host of uncommitted people also walked away. Jesus was no longer talking only about grace. He was speaking about obligation. And so many people do not want to be obligated in serving God. Dear friends, Jesus was committed to doing the Father's will. And what we need in our churches and in our Christian walk are Christians who are courageous in doing what God wants them to do and Christians who are committed to following after God regardless of what the cost might be. We need committed Christians. Not just nominal, but committed. And then the third thing about Jesus, he was compassionate. I think that kind of brought about the commitment, his love for the Father. I think it brought about his, the courage he had. He was compassionate. It says there in the word of God, you know, the greater love hath no man than a man that lay down his life for his friends. Jesus was willing to lay down his life for others. And I thought about that. And I began doing a little study this week about what the father might have gone through. What the father might have gone through seeing his son there on that cross. Sometimes we don't think of that. Now we know the Bible says 
that God so loved the world that he gave his son. But then I read a story. As you know, I like stories. A story about a, actually a pastor whose little girl, they were taking the little girl to Disneyland to see all the sights. And the day before she got sick, and became worse during the day. They finally had to take her to the hospital. And they did all kinds of tests, CAT scans and so on. And then she was in the little bed in the hospital, her father sitting with her. And the doctor said to her, now honey, he said, we've got to do one more test. He said, we've got to do a spinal tap. The father knew what that meant, especially in that time. There's more treatment now. And for people, for it not to be so painful. But he knew the pain she'd go through. So they took her into the room for the spinal tap. The father went with her, held her. He said it was the most horrible thing to see her little body naked there, lying there, waiting for the spinal tap. And they told her it would be painful. And the father said he held her. And he held her. And he said as they did this, she was screaming out, Daddy, Daddy, help me help me daddy he said and he could do nothing but just hold her and cry with her he said in that very moment he said the thought came to him that must have been like God the father when he saw his son hanging there on that cross in ignominy and shame and suffering all that torture and yet knowing he was doing that for you and for me because of his great love for us. I can't begin to comprehend that love, but I accept it as God's gift for you and me. Dear friends, as we come to this holy week, let's focus our thoughts on the cross of Christ and what he did for us. Think of his courage, his commitment, and his great compassion for you and for me. Amen. As we continue in our worship service this morning, part of our worship is giving to God of our tithes and our offerings. As Margaret comes and plays, we invite you to come keeping social distancing to put your tithes and offerings in. I realize that some folks give through online and other ways, send in their offering, but those who would like to, we invite you to come to give. Don is going to sing for us as we have the offering.
God's blessing on the offering. Our Father, we're thankful for this offering and ask your blessing upon it. And Lord, we pray that it'll be used for your glory, both here in our church and throughout the outreach ministries of our church. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And we'll sing in closing our final hymn as Margaret comes to play. Thank you all for coming today on this Palm Sunday, and we hope we'll see you again on Thursday or Friday, and of course next Sunday, Easter Sunday, we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. Let's stand for the benediction, please. I might mention that Kevin's mother's here visiting from uh, California, and we're so glad to have you in the service today. God bless you. Thank you for coming. Our Father, we ask now that you would dismiss us with your blessing. And Lord, we think of the words, Hosanna, we think of the meaning to save. And we're thankful that because you desired to save us, 
you sent your son, who with his courage, his commitment, and his compassion went to a cross to be our redeemer. Lord, we praise you and thank you for this and ask that as we leave here today, we would leave here thinking of that and your wonderful love for us. We ask this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you. Thank you.